Well, we're here today with uh, Robert Massey, Pulitzer Prize winning author, biographer, and historian. And he's recently released a beautifully written book about Catherine the Great. So welcome to Nashville, though I should say welcome back to Nashville because you grew up here and because of that, the city takes full credit for all of your many successes. Well, thank you, Skip. I'm, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to be here, particularly here, talking to you. Well, t tell me a little bit more about that journey from a kid in Nashville to a Russian scholar. Well, it was uh, life, fate, I guess you could say. I married, and uh, my wife and I had uh, a baby, and he turned out, we found it out when he was about four months old, to be a hemophiliac. And I knew I had studied history and uh, various universities, and I knew something about Nicholas II, the last Tsar, and his son, Alexis, who was also a hemophiliac. So I was working at Newsweek. I started uh, spending my lunch hours down at the New York Public Library reading what I could uh, about them just out of curiosity. I mean, we were dealing with, in the, this was the 1950s, but we were dealing with a, a, a child who had more the treatment facilities available than certainly a, even the Russian crown prince. But it was a very interesting story. Most people knew a two-sentence version. He had, the boy had a blood bleeding disease. Rasputin came in and hypnotized him, and the empress was involved, and this was damaging for Russia at the very end of the dynasty. I decided to write something a little bit more uh, closer in terms of the family, and uh, I thought uh, more revealing of what happened in, in Russia at that, at, that, at that time. And having done that, I uh, realized I really didn't know much Russian history. I was sort of learning, and that the most interesting uh, person, the most interesting emperor, was Peter the Great. So I set off on another much longer journey to write a biography of Peter the Great. It took a long time. It was also a big success. It won a significant prize. And uh, I was pegged uh, in people's, well, certainly my publisher's mind, as a Russian. Uh, and so I've written a couple more books. The latest one you just, you just mentioned. Well, that's certainly a way to take uh, a difficult circumstance in life and turn it into something that benefits uh, society and, and changes your the, the course of your own career. So You're absolutely right. And I think uh, many, a lot of interesting books come out of that kind of challenge. Well, let's let's turn to Catherine. Um, it's, it's a story. It has all the elements of success. It has suspense. It has... Uh, sex, it has political intrigue, it has all of these different um, elements of ambition and high, uh, high drama. How did this, this young German, relatively modest means um, teenager, end up being the most powerful woman in the world, Empress of Russia? How did, how did that journey begin for her? Well, the answer to the overall question, she worked at it. That's how she did it. It began because Germany was overrun with insignificant little princes, princesses and princes. There were so many little kingdoms and grand duchies and electorates and principalities and so forth that everybody was a princess or prince. She was nobody, really. Her father was a very minor figure, and she was even more minor. She was a daughter, and what parents were looking for then was sons. Daughters were a liability. They had to be married off and with dowries and so forth. But there was a connection between Empress Elizabeth of Russia, Peter the Great's daughter, and that family. Uh, and when she was looking for a wife for her, Elizabeth this was, for her nephew, who was the crown prince, the Tsarevich, uh, she thought of Catherine. Her mother was, Catherine's mother was busy promoting her. By the way, her name then was Sophia. And sending portraits of her, favorable portraits. And so Elizabeth invited her. She went to Russia at 14 with her mother. 
and 16 married this boy who was a pretty sad case, both in appearance, psychology. He was, uh, we would say, deficient. It, it seems th that part of, of the story that certainly it was it would not be one of the best uh, romance novels of the day. Uh, he he had some issues. You very much so. First of all, after she met him, he then had a severe bout with smallpox, and he was badly marked. She said uh, that she couldn't recognize him, uh, but he was also juvenile. He was a sort of a man child. He was interested in toy soldiers. He was not interested in women. Uh, they did marry when she was 16 and he was 17. And she lay in bed next to her husband for nine years and he never touched her. Uh, and, at, and so they never produced the child, which was her reason for being there and which Elizabeth wanted as a sort of a backup to the dynasty. Uh, and then Elizabeth said uh, to Catherine, something has to be done about this. There are two young men uh, at court whom you know very well. Which one of you would you like, which one of them would you consider as a surrogate husband? Catherine chose one and produced a baby. Now, now, was that common in that day if you couldn't produce an heir or there was an issue to just simply have an arrangement? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, uh, I don't know of any, uh, but that's a very interesting question. Now that you've raised it, I'm going to go back and look look again, because if there was, I should have included it in the book. Yeah, it's it's certainly one of those those great great questions. As well, I, I, I there were it. there were women royals as well as others who had children out of wedlock. But whether this was uh, induced, forced on them by uh, uh, an authority figure who had her own reasons for uh, needing a baby, uh, I don't know of. And what's so odd is it wouldn't even be her heir uh, biologically, and yet it was still something that she... she well, the interesting thing, too, is since we consider and the Russian, the, the follow-on Russian Tsars always wanted it to be the Romanov dynasty up until the end, the revolution. Uh, had it not been her husband, who was the father, had it been Sergei Soltikov, it would be the Soltikov dynasty. So the 19th century Russian Tsars sat on this story very firmly. Mm, interesting. Well, let's let's fast forward in the story for Catherine to uh, when Elizabeth dies, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden political intrigue unfolds of how Catherine ascends to the throne. Tell us a little bit more. About well, that. Peter, as I said, was uh, ill-equipped, almost incompetent in every way. Russia was his; he was now the emperor. He didn't want to be. He wanted. He was brought up in Germany. He wanted to go back. He admired Frederick the Great, the King of Prussia, with whom Russia had been fighting. Peter came to the throne and immediately alienated the, Catholic, the Orthodox Church, the Guards regiments by uh, making peace with with uh, Prussia and handing back all of the gains of the Russian army, and then declaring war on. Denmark for reasons which had nothing to do with Russia. And they were supposed to march back and start another war. So they were hostile. The nobility was hostile. The people of St. Petersburg who observed him, his performance publicly as Tsar. So there was uh, a gathering of forces to replace him. Who was the best equipped intellectually and even politically uh, in terms of understanding what Russia needed. It was his wife, this German girl. Now, she'd lived there for 18 years, his wife, so she wasn't a total neophyte. And her then lover, one of her first lovers, Peter didn't care, was uh, one of five brothers, all of whom were guards officers in the Imperial Guard. So they uh, seeded the, uh, the, the turf. They opened the path. 
she, there was a coup d'etat, bloodless. Peter uh, didn't resist. He abdicated. The problem was, and she rode out uh, to the suburban palace where he was at the head of 14,000 men uh, to be sure that he would understand and sign a document saying he abdicated. Then she sent him to detention to a country house, and a week later he was dead. The question that bedeviled her the rest of her life was what role she played in this. Was she part of the planning? Did she issue the orders? Uh, if not, uh, was it just some spontaneous... The, the guards officers who were guarding him hated him, but uh, would they have done this without her say so? Uh, no one knows. Historians who've spent more time than I have not been able to decide. Uh, she was very anxious uh, that Europe understand that she was not involved. But there's one uh, detail which uh, makes her story a little less convincing. She, she issued a proclamation, the emperor is dead, uh, mourners will be able to visit the body. The Russian Orthodox Church lays out the corpse for quite a while. Uh, and uh, sadly, I have to announce that uh, my husband, Peter, died of hemorrhoidal colic. He was actually strangled. And that casts some additional doubt. I personally... Uh, from not from physical medical evidence, but just from her character, think that she did not say, you know what I want done. That they figured out what she wanted done. Or that at least they uh, thought. Because if she was a widow, then she could marry Gregory Orloff, who'd been her lover for 10 years. Uh, she couldn't, if he were, even if he were deported back to Germany or whatever. So that's one of the two or three great unsolved Mystery. mysteries. Interesting. Well, one of the things I love, love is studying leaders, uh, both from a biograph biographical perspective, leaders today, leadership qualities. And it strikes me, in addition to her uh, ambition and certainly taking advantage of, of things, but she, she had this ability to ingratiate herself and, and work. she worked very hard to quickly learn Russian language and, and, and get yeah. on board and build alliances and uh, she certainly would seemingly be a big uh, Facebook and Twitter user because she she was communicating with all these great minds of the day um, yeah. that uh, that list that goes on and on. Um, what what do you make of that, and what kind of qualities? If you're a leader today, looking back at her, what what do you see as some of the lessons well, of leadership? First of all, she was very ambitious, even as a small child. Uh, she was. Peter, who was actually her second cousin, was in the curious position of being a potential heir to the throne of Russia and to the throne of Sweden. And when she met him, and they were both children, uh, the possibility of him becoming king of Sweden was greater. And she knew that what the grown-ups were talking about like this and so forth were those possibilities. And she says in her memoirs, the title of queen rang sweetly in my ears. But then she was went to Russia. This was a greater opportunity. She found Peter uh, boring, impossible, but he was going to be the emperor, and she would be the empress. And all along, Catherine had in the back of her mind, when she saw how inept he was, I will be the, at least the power behind the throne, and who knows? Uh, so it was a sense of, of destiny, and in, in one sense. Also, she worked hard at it. Hard work, uh, ambition. Well, you talked about future, among what can... Courage, great intelligence. Uh, she was enormously articulate. Her dialogues with the, the Empress, she... Uh, where, the, where the empress had all the power, Catherine backed her in, into a corner in, in terms of logic. Uh, she turned everything around, sort of the, the way a brilliant TV guy can now with a helpless uh, interviewee. But uh, 
and a genuine interest in in people. I mean, she was, in a sense, in a in a personal sense, a liberal. She believed in monarchy. She believed that Russia desperately needed reform, but she believed it should come from the top. She was opposed to all revolutions. Uh, the one in Russia, after she'd been on the throne about 15 years, she put down severely. And then the French Revolution, which she thought threatened everything. I mean, the French had beheaded their king. This was, you know, unthinkable. And so she became very conservative politically at the end of her life. Uh, I think, uh, you know, circumstances are very different today, but the kind of uh, ambition modified by intelligence. She wanted to be, if she was going to be empress, she was going to be a despot, somebody who ruled without anybody else's say-so. But she wanted to be a benevolent despot, and she wanted to raise her country by education, by uh, uh, wealth, uh, bringing Russia even further into the modern world than Peter the Great had. Uh, as, as I think you can tell from reading it, I admired her, her career and what she did. When I read it, I did. You, I felt like I got to know her personally, and certainly, I'm sure, you know, talking to you, that, that you feel like you know her personally. You have an emotional connection, it seems, with with the subjects of some of your books. Is it hard to put them away and and go on to another project? It's a very good question because I am right now. I have just turned in before coming to Nashville uh, a piece to the New York Times book review who asked at exactly that question, how do you feel when you're leaving some subject that you've been living with a long time? Uh, you feel uh, relief on the one hand and sadness on the other. Uh, for eight years, more or less, I've been coming upstairs with my morning coffee and sitting down and spending the day with this woman. And I admire my, much of what she did, and I, I think a, a fair reader would say that I've, uh, what I've tried to do is uh, explain uh, what happened, not excuse, because some of the things she did, neither you or I would uh, applaud. But um, I admired the fact that she did, she got so far starting from basically nothing. It's, a, it's, a, it's the ultimate success story. It, it certainly is. Well, you're your own success story with all of these fabulous books and, and biographies. And at, at an age when most people are, are, are done saying, I'm just going to enjoy life, you continue to churn out these magnificent works. So I have to ask, who's next as a subject or that's what a good, topic? That's a, good, that's a good question. The Random House is curious. We've talked. Uh, I had written, I'd written four, I've written four books about Russian subjects. I've written two about something entirely different, the British and American navies in the First World War. I was in the American Navy for a long time. I, I'm interested in that. But Random House thinks that uh, because of you and all of the people who are helping me and them uh, get this book to people, uh, people will think of me as somebody who writes about women uh, maybe women who rule, or women who are connected. And uh, the subject of uh, Josephine, Napoleon and Josephine, has come up, and I'm, uh, that's not uninteresting. The problem is there are six. Somebody said six hundred thousand books about Napoleon, but this wouldn't be everything, you know. Uh, I'm also interested in. Uh, the parallel lives of Elizabeth I and Mary Stuart. They were cousins. Uh, both had difficult childhoods. You know, Elizabeth spent time in the tower because she was Protestant and her sister Mary was the queen and Catholic. Uh, Mary Stuart went to France. Her mother was French. She was queen of France for a few years when she was a child. She came back to Scotland when her young husband died. She was Queen of Scotland, and then she wanted to be Queen of England, and her cousin was on the throne, and uh, 
she was locked up, well, in detention, really, rather comfortable detention for 20 years. And then Elizabeth caught her, or Walsingham caught her, sending out these letters, which had to do with Elizabeth's removal, and she was beheaded. Uh, I couldn't write two even dual parallel biographies. Is there some way to talk about the differences and the challenges and what? Uh, and I've got to consider, you know, with every writer, how much time is there, uh, how much the publisher agree. Uh, but one thing's certain, your success um, and, and the fact that you're interested in so many different subjects, you have this insatiable curiosity and... Uh, one thing certain is you're you're on to thinking about the next yeah, topic and the next subject, yes, and that's I, exciting for all of us to, well, to see what that thank is. Thank you. I am, I am. You'll be the first to know. Excellent. <laughs> we'll count on that, and we will also uh, count on the success of Catherine because it's an amazing story. Like all of the books that you've uh, written in the past, this one is, is particularly gripping and. You've made history come alive, and, and that's a, a, a unique gift, and we thank you for, for coming here and sharing that with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.